Okay, tonight is the 27th of July. This is the 12th night we are talking on the Diga Nikaya Suttas. Yesterday we started on Diga Nikaya number 16, so we continue today on page 244. And when the Lord had stayed at Ambapali's grove as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to the little village of Baluva where he stayed. Then the Lord said to the monks, You monks should go to anywhere in Vesali where you have friends or acquaintances or supporters and spend the rains there. I shall spend the rains here in Baluva. Very good, Lord, replied the monks. And they did so. But the Lord spent the rains in Baluva. And during the rains, the Lord was attacked by a severe sickness with sharp pains as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully, clearly aware and without complaining. He thought, It is not fitting that I should attain final Nibbana without addressing my followers and taking leave of the Sangha of monks. I must hold this disease in check by energy and, and apply myself to the force of life. He did so, and the disease abated. Then the Lord, having recovered from his sickness, as soon as he felt better, went outside and sat on a prepared seat in front of his dwelling. Then the Venerable Ananda came to him, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, I have seen the Lord in comfort and I have seen the Lord's patience enduring. And Lord, my body was like a drunkard's. I lost my bearings and things were unclear to me because of the Lord's sickness. The only thing that was some comfort to me was the thought, the Lord will not attain final Nibbana until he has made some statement about the Sangha of monks. And the Buddha said, But Ananda, what does the Sangha of monks expect of me? I have, I have taught the Dhamma, Ananda, making no inner and outer. The Tathagata has no teacher's fist in respect of Dhamma. If there is anyone who thinks I shall take charge of the Sangha, or the Sangha should refer to me. Let him make some statement about the Sangha. But the Tathagata does not think in such terms. So why should the Tathagata make a statement about the Sangha? Ananda, I am now old, worn out, venerable, one who has traversed life's path. I have reached the term of life, which is 80, just as an old cart is made to go by being held together with straps. So the Tathagata's body is kept going by being strapped up. It is only when the Tathagata withdraws his attention from outward signs and by the cessation of certain feelings enters into the signless concentration of mind that his body knows comfort. Therefore, Ananda, you should live as islands unto yourselves, being your own refuge, with no one else as your refuge. With the Dhamma as an island, with the Dhamma as your refuge, with no other refuge. And how does a monk live as an island unto himself, with no other refuge? Here, Ananda, a monk abides contemplating the body in the body, earnestly, clearly aware, mindful, and having put away all hankering and fretting for the world. And likewise, with regard to feelings, mind, and Dhamma. That, Ananda, is how a monk lives as an island unto himself, with no other refuge. And those who now, in my time or afterwards, live thus, they will become the highest, if they are desirous of learning. Stop here for a moment. This part is quite important. You see, the Buddha says, huh? I have taught the Dhamma, Ananda, making no inner and outer the Tathagata has no teacher's fist in respect of Dhamma. So here he's saying uh, there's no inner and outer circle of disciples. Uh, uh, just like, uh, uh, like when you compare with the uh, Chinese tradition, uh, they, they have, uh, uh, what they say, Lai Sun, Gua Sun, Roi Sin, Roi Sin, uh, inner, uh, inner grandchildren and outer grandchildren. Uh, the inner one is closer to them, uh, uh, namely the son's children, uh, or the daughter's children are considered outer. Uh, so there's a discrimination. 
uh, what the Chinese are regarding the male and the female. But here the Buddha says uh, there, there is no inner and outer circle of uh, disciples. Uh, also, there is no teacher's fist uh, in respect of Dhamma. In other words, he does not hold back something like, in his fist. Uh, uh, but in the Mahayana teachings, uh, they contradict this. Uh, they say that uh, the Buddha uh, did not teach the Mahayana Dhamma to his disciples, uh, to his Savaka disciples, because uh, they were didn't have the wisdom uh, to understand the Mahayana teachings. So the Buddha they claim uh, the Buddha hid the Mahayana teachings in the ocean. And then uh, after 500 years, our uh, this uh, Longsu Pusa, his Pali name is Nagajuna, uh, he claimed uh, he went to the Dragon Palace uh, underneath the sea uh, and took out all the Mahayana Sutras. Uh. But there's no such thing, uh, the Buddha says. Uh, he does not uh, hold back some of his teachings and he does not discriminate. Uh. Uh, inner and outer circle of disciples. Uh, so why would he uh, not want to teach uh, Mahayana teachings? Uh, if it was the Buddha's teachings, he would have taught his disciples then. then uh. <clears throat> also, you see where the Buddha is 80 years old, uh, has come to life's end. Uh, uh, the Buddha, every now and then, uh, he feels uh, discomfort and, and pain. So he has to go into the signless concentration uh, then only uh, he knows some comfort. So, uh, this last part, uh, in some other suttas, they translate it as, uh, be, an, be a lamb unto yourself, be a refuge unto yourself, in no other refuge. Take the Dhamma as your lamb, take the Dhamma as your refuge, with no other refuge. Uh. So here, basically, uh, the Buddha is saying, uh, rely on yourself, and rely on Dhamma, only these two. Uh, uh, not like nowadays, a lot of people, uh, they don't study the Buddha's words. Uh, they don't know uh, that there's so much uh, the Buddha has said. Uh, the Buddha says his teachings are complete, uh, perfect and complete. Uh, there's no need to add to his words. Uh, uh, so, but uh, nowadays, a lot of monks uh, go all over the world uh, looking for a famous teacher. Uh, uh, if the teacher can guide you uh, to the Buddha's original words, uh, then uh, you should uh, uh, take heed. Uh, if he teaches his own Dhamma, uh, then you don't need to take heed. Uh, uh, any monk uh, who teaches uh, should only teach the Buddha's Dhamma, not his own Dhamma, not his own views. Uh. Okay, then the Lord, rising early, dressed, took his robe and bowl and entered Vesali for arms, having eaten on his re- he having eaten on his return from the arms round, he said to the venerable Ananda, Bring a mat, Ananda. We will go to the Chapala shrine for the siesta. Very good, Lord. Uh, for the rest. Huh? And getting a mat, he followed behind. Then the Lord came to the Chapala shrine and sat down on the prepared seat. Ananda saluted the Lord and sat down to one side. And the Lord said, Ananda, Vesali is delightful. The Udena shrine is delightful. The Gotamaka shrine is delightful. The Sam Satambaka shrine is delightful. The Bahuputta shrine is delightful. The Chapala shrine is delightful. Ananda, whoever has developed the four, here it says four roads to power. Huh? Other places they translate it as the four bases of psychic power. Huh? Uh, Practice them frequently, made them his vehicle, made them his base, establish them, become familiar with them, and properly undertaken them, could undoubtedly live for a kappa, a world aeon, or the remainder of one. Here they, they translate a century, but the real Pali word is kappa, meaning an aeon, world cycle, or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers, properly undertaken them, and he could, Ananda, undoubtedly live for a kappa, or the remainder of one. But the Venerable Ananda, failing to grasp this broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Lord, Lord, may the Blessed One stay for a kappa, or a world, for an aeon. May the welfarer stay for an aeon, for the benefit and happiness of the multitude. 
out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. So much was his mind possessed by Mara. And a second time the Buddha said, and a third time the Buddha said the same thing. Then the Lord said, Ananda, go now and do what seems fitting to you. Very good Lord, said Ananda, and rising from his seat, saluted the Lord, passed by on the right and sat down under a tree some distance away. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha is telling Ananda that whoever has developed fully like, the four Edi Padas, the four Edi Pada, Edi is psychic power, like, Pada is path. Like. The four paths or bases huh, to attain psychic power and practice them frequently. Huh? If he wanted to, uh, he could live for a kappa, a world cycle. Uh, and he said, the Buddha says, uh, he has developed this idipada, and he can do that. Uh, and uh, he, do, he dropped this hint, uh, and Ananda did not beg him uh, to live for this world cycle. Uh, a lot of people uh, find it uh, uh, unacceptable uh, that the Buddha says uh, he could live for a world cycle. So either they modify it uh, to a uh, Ayu Kappa, which is a life aeon. Life aeon meaning uh, at that time, if people lived during the Buddha's time, uh, if the people at that time uh, generally uh, could live up to a hundred years, uh, then the Buddha was the Buddha man, uh, according to these people who interpreted uh, that the Buddha said uh, he could live on for another twenty years. Uh, until he was a hundred. Uh, that's one interpretation. Then here is, uh, uh, that's why it says here is a century, a uh, hundred years. Uh, instead of saying a century, if you, he, he, what they meant is actually a ayu kappa, a life aeon, a life. Uh, because the Buddha says in some other sutta, a human being's lifespan uh, can vary uh, from 80,000 years, which is the maximum, down to 10 years. Uh, that's why when I was young uh, and I studied the Bible uh, in school, uh, I remember that they said uh, the ages of some of these uh, uh, early sages like Moses and Abraham uh, was something in terms of like 25,000 years and all that. But nowadays, uh, because they, they think uh, the figure is so ridiculous, uh, they don't understand that lifespan can go so high. They have reduced all those. If you look at the modern Bibles, uh, all the ages have been reduced. Uh. So this uh, Nanda, uh, he did not ask the Buddha to stay on. Uh, and this was one of the things uh, uh, the Arahants found fault with him. Uh, after the Buddha passed away, uh, they found fault with Ananda over a few things. Uh, this was one of them. Uh. Soon after Ananda had left, Mara, the evil one, came to the Lord, stood to one side and said, Lord, may the blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the blessed Lord's final Nibbana. Because the blessed Lord has said this, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of Dhamma, trained in conformity with Dhamma, correctly trained and walking the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher, teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear, till they, have, till they shall be able by means of the Dhamma to refute false teachings that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effect. And now, Lord, the blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana, May the welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the blessed Lord has said, I will not take final Nibbana till I have nuns and female disciples who are accomplished, etc. Or till I have lay men followers who are accomplished, etc. Till I have lay women followers who are accomplished, etc. May the blessed Lord now take final Nibbana. And the blessed Lord has said, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till this holy life has been successfully established and flourishes, is widespread, well known far and wide, well proclaimed among mankind everywhere. And all this has come about. May the blessed one now attain final Nibbana. May the welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the blessed Lord's final Nibbana. At this the Lord said to Mara, 
you need not worry, evil one. The Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana. And so the Lord at the Chapala Shrine, mindfully and in full awareness, renounced the life principle. And when this occurred, there was a great earthquake, terrible, hair-raising and accompanied by thunder. And when the Lord saw this, he uttered this verse, Gross or fine, things become the sage abjured, sworn. Calm, composed, he burst, becoming shell. Stop here for a moment. So here, uh, Mara has been pursuing the Buddha to enter, enter Nibbana many times. At one time, he, the Buddha said he will not enter Nibbana until the monks and the disciples are well trained. And then another time when the Mara uh, asked the Buddha to ask to enter Nibbana, the Buddha said uh, he will not enter Nibbana until the nuns la, and the female disciples are accomplished and well trained, etc. Then another time when Mara came, the Buddha said he will not enter, ni- enter Nibbana until the layman followers la, are accomplished. La. And then another time he said until the lay women followers are accomplished. La. Then another time he said he will not take a tenter, enter final nibbana until the sasana, the Buddhist religion, is established and widespread, etc. So now, the Buddha, uh, uh, this uh, last time uh, when Mara came to ask the Buddha to enter nibbana, then the Buddha said, okay, lah, three months time he will enter nibbana. So this Mara keeps telling, asking the Buddha to enter Nibbana because he doesn't want the Buddha to continue teaching the Dhamma and lead uh, more people, <coughs> more people across the to the other shore la, to enter Nibbana and leave this uh, uh, round of rebirths. Uh, so you see, the, the, when the Buddha decided to enter Nibbana, he renounced the life principle. The volition, the sankara, is the. Uh, actually, this one should be uh, ayu sankara, the uh, will to live, uh, will to live. Uh, so the Buddha renounced the will to live. Uh, uh, then only uh, the Buddha can enter nibbana. Uh, that's why I, I say uh, in the dependent origination, uh, sankara always refers to the will to live. Uh, if you don't. Uh, let go of the will to live, uh, you will still live on. Uh. And the Venerable Ananda thought, it is marvelous, it is wonderful how this great earthquake arises, this terrible earthquake, so dreadful and hair-raising, accompanied by thunder. Whatever can have caused it, he went to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and asked him that question. And the Buddha said, Ananda, there are eight reasons eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. This great earth is established on water, the water on the wind, the wind on space. And when a mighty wind blows, this stirs up the water, and through the stirring up of the water, the earth wakes. That is the first reason. In the second place, there is an ascetic or Brahmin who has developed psychic powers, or a mighty and powerful Deva whose earth consciousness is weakly developed and his water consciousness is immeasurable and he makes the earth shudder and quake and violently quake. That is the second reason. Again, when a bodhisattva descends from the Tusita heaven, mindful and clearly aware into his mother's womb, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the third reason. Again, when the bodhisattva emerges from his mother's womb, mindful and clearly aware, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the fourth reason. Again, when the Tathagata gains unsurpassed enlightenment, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes, is the fifth reason. Again, when the Tathagata sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes, is the sixth reason. Again, when the Tathagata, mindful and clearly aware, renounces the um, uh, will to live, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. Again, when the Tathagata gains a Nibbana element without remainder, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the eighth reason. These, Ananda, are the eight reasons, the eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. 
So this, uh, you see the first one the Buddha says, uh, the earth is established on water, water on wind, wind on space. Uh, this one people will find it a bit hard to uh, to see. La. But it reminds me la, because uh, our water source uh, is up on the hill, la, very high up, a few hundred feet high. Yeah. And the water comes out from the ground, uh, comes out from the ground. And uh, surprisingly, yeah, even though this water trickles out from the, from the ground, uh, you have small fish coming out and small crabs and small prawns coming out from the ground, up in the mountain, up in the hill. So evidently, uh, uh, this water uh, comes from a source uh, underneath. Uh, and this underneath, uh, there must be a lot of water uh, to have uh, prawns and crabs and uh, fish and all that uh, come out. Uh. So it reminds me because the Buddha here, the Buddha here says uh, that the earth uh, is established on water. Uh, the water is below the earth. Uh. So layer, probably a layer down there. Uh. Ananda. These eight kinds of, there are these eight kinds of assemblies. What are they? They are the assembly of Katyas or noble, uh, the warrior clan. Assembly of Brahmins, assembly of householders, assembly of ascetics, assembly of devas of the realm of the four great kings, assembly of the thirty-three gods, assembly of Maras, assembly of Brahmas. Remember well, Ananda, many hundreds of assemblies of Katyas that I have attended. And before I sat down with them, spoke to them or joined in their conversation, I adopted their appearance and speech, whatever it might be. And I instructed, inspired, fired and delighted them with a discourse on Dhamma. And as I spoke with them, they did not know me and wondered, who is it that speaks like this, a deva or a man? And having thus instructed them, I disappeared and still they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he a deva or a man? And remember well many hundreds of assemblies of Brahmins, of householders, of ascetics, of devas of the realm of the four great kings, of the thirty-three gods, of Maras, of Brahmas. And uh, the same thing happened. The Buddha uh, joined them in their conversation and taught them the Dhamma. And still they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he a deva or a man? Those Ananda are the eight assemblies. Ananda, there are eight stages of mastery. What are they? Perceiving forms internally. Once, one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the first stage. Perceiving forms internally. One sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly, etc. That is the second stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly, etc. This is the third stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the fourth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are blue, of blue color, of blue luster. Just as a flax flower which is blue, of blue color, of blue luster, or a banaris cloth smooth on both sides that is blue. So one perceives external forms that are blue. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the fifth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are yellow. Just as a kanikara flower which is yellow, or a banaris cloth which is yellow. So one perceives external forms that are yellow. This is the sixth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are red, just as a hibiscus flower which is red, or a banaras cloth which is red. So one perceives external forms that are red. This is the seventh stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are white, of white color, of white luster, just as the morning star or sadi is white, or a banaras cloth smooth on both sides that is white. So not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are white. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the eighth stage of mastery. Stop here for a moment. Uh. These four colors mentioned here uh, are part of the kasinas. La. If you meditate on colors, uh, these are the four colors. Uh, white, red, yellow, blue, uh. 
There are ananda, these eight liberations, what are they? Possessing form, one sees forms, this is the first. Not perceiving material forms in oneself, one sees them outside, this is the second. Thinking it is beautiful, one becomes intent on it, this is the third. By completely transcending all perception of matter, thinking space is infinite, one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite space, that is the fourth. By transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite, one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite consciousness, that is the fifth. By transcending the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing, one enters and abides in the sphere of no-thingness, this is the sixth. By transcending the sphere of no-thingness, one reaches and abides in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, that is the seventh. By transcending the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, one enters and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling. That is the eighth liberation. Uh, stop here for a moment. This one, uh, the eight liberations, we went through them uh, in the previous sutta, number 15. Uh. Ananda, once I was staying at Uruvela on the bank of the river Naranjara under the goat herd's banyan tree. When I had just attained supreme enlightenment, and Mara, the evil one, came to me, stood to one side and said, May the Blessed One now attain final Nibbana. May the Welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. At this I said to Mara, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, etc., uh, till I have nuns, laymen followers, laywomen followers, who will teach the Dhamma of wondrous effect. I will not take final Nibbana till this holy life has been firmly established and flourishes, is widespread, well known, far and wide, well proclaimed among mankind everywhere. And just now today, Ananda, at the Chapala shrine, Mara came to me, stood to one side and said, Lord, may the Blessed One now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Lord. Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And I said, You need not worry, evil one. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana. So now today, Ananda, at the Chapala Shrine, the Tathagata has mindfully and in full awareness renounced the will to live. At this, the Venerable Ananda said, Lord, may the Blessed One stay for a kappa or aeon. May the welfarer stay for an aeon for the benefit and happiness of the multitude out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. And the Buddha said, Enough, Ananda, do not beg the Tathagata. It is not the right time for that. And a second time and a third time, the Venerable Ananda made the same request. And the Buddha said, Ananda, have you faith, have, have you faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment? Yes, Lord. Then why do you bother the Tathagata with your request up to three times? But Lord, I have heard from the Lord's own lips, I have understood from the Lord's own lips, whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power could undoubtedly live for an aeon or for the remainder of one. And the Buddha said, Have you faith, Ananda? Yes, Lord. Then, Ananda, yours is the fault, yours is the failure, that having been given such a broad hint, as a clear sign by the Tathagata, you did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for an aeon. If, Ananda, you had begged him, the Tathagata would twice have refused you, but the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, yours is the fault, yours is the failure. Once, Ananda, I was staying at Rajagaha, at the vulture's peak, and there I said, Ananda, Rajagaha is delightful, the vulture's peak is delightful. Whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power could undoubtedly live for us for an aeon. But you, Ananda, in spite of such a broad hint, did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. Once, I was staying at Rajagaha in the Banyan Park at Robert's Cliff at the Satapani Cave on the side of Mount Vibara at the Black Slope at the black rock on the slope of Mount Isigili, at the slope by the snake's pool in cool wood, at the Tapoda Park, at the squirrel's feeding ground in Veluvana, in Jivaka's mango grove, and also at Rajagaha in the Mad Madakuchi Deer Park. At all these places, I said to you, Ananda, this place is delightful, etc. Whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power could undoubtedly live for an aeon. Once I was at Vesali in the Udena Shrine. Once 
I was at Vesali in the Gotamaka Shrine, at the Satambaka Shrine, at the Bahuputta Shrine, at the Sar- Sarandada Shrine. And now today at the Chapala Shrine, I said, these places are delightful, Ananda. Whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power would undoubtedly live for an aeon or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers and he could, Ananda, undoubtedly live for an aeon or the remainder of one. But you, Ananda, failing to grasp this broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Tathagatas to stay for an aeon. If, Ananda, you had begged him, the Tathagata would twice have refused you, but the third time he would have consented. Ananda, have I not told you before, all those things that are dear and pleasant to us must suffer change, separation and alteration. How could this be possible. Whatever is born, become compounded, is liable to decay. That it should not decay is impossible. And that has been renounced, given up, rejected, abandoned, forsaken. The Tathagata has renounced the will to live. The Tathagata has said once and for all, the Tathagata's final passing will not will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana. That the Tathagata should withdraw such a declaration in order to live on is not possible. Come now, Ananda, we will go to the Gable Hall in the Great Forest. Very good, Lord. Stop here for a moment. Uh. So here, Venerable Ananda appealed to the Buddha to stay on for an aeon. Uh. But it was too late. Uh. He already told Mara uh, that three months from now, uh, he will enter Nibbana. And the Lord went with the Venerable Ananda to the Gable Hall in the Great Forest. When he got there, he said, Ananda, go and gather together all the monks living in the vicinity of Vesali and get them to come to the Assembly Hall. Very good, Lord, said Ananda, and he did so. He then returned to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, Lord, the order of the Sangha of monks is gathered together. Now is the time for the Lord to do as he wishes. Then the Lord entered the assembly hall and sat down the prepared seat. Then he said to the monks, Monks, for this reason, those matters which I have discovered and proclaimed should be thoroughly learned by you, practiced, developed and cultivated, so that this holy life may endure for a long time that it may be for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. And what are those matters? They are the four intense states of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four bases of psychic power, the five spiritual faculties, the five powers, the seven factors of enlightenment, the noble eightfold path. Then the Lord said to the monks, And now, monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are of a nature to decay. Strive on untiringly. The Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take his final Nibbana. Thus the Lord spoke. The welfarer, having thus spoken, the teacher said this, Ripe I am in years, my lifespan's determined. Now I go from you, having made myself my refuge. Monks, be untiring, mindful, disciplined, guarding your minds with well-collected thought. He who, tireless, keeps to Dhamma and Vinaya, leaving birth behind, will put an end to war. So here the Buddha is telling his disciples uh, that the most important uh, parts of his teaching uh, are in these 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, the four uh, Satipatthana, the four uh, what is it, Vayama, uh, the, the, the four Idipada, the five uh, Indriya, the five Bala, the seven Bojanga, and the Arya Atangika Magala. 37 if you add them all together. Uh, mm.